All right. Uh, so let me just warn you in advance. Uh, every time I've tried to give a talk using slides, it ends early. So I've tried to compensate by preparing way more slides than I could possibly cover in an hour. And uh, we'll see if I succeeded. Uh, so I want to in this talk, just give you a brief overview of chromatic homotopy theory, sort of an advertisement of what it's about and why you might want to learn about it. So chromatic homotopy theory, it's a part of stable homotopy theory. So let me just remind you that if you have a topological space with a base point, then in algebraic topology, one of the most important invariants it's of that space is its homotopy groups. Uh, the nth homotopy group is the set of homotopy classes of pointed maps from an n-sphere into x. And well, um, these are related by suspension maps. Uh, the formation of suspension gives you a, a map from the nth homotopy group of a space x to the n plus first homotopy group of its suspension. And by iterating this procedure, you can take a direct limit and introduce what are called the stable homotopy groups of x. Um, and these are the basic objects of interest in stable homotopy theory. So these are important invariants of topological spaces, but they're very difficult to get your hands on, even in very simple cases. So more or less the simplest case of all is to start with the, the space, which is the sphere of dimension zero. And its stable homotopy groups are called the stable homotopy groups of spheres or the homotopy groups of the sphere spectrum. So I'm gonna denote the nth stable homotopy group of spheres by pi n of s. And uh, basic question in the subject is what do these groups look like? What can we say about them? So let me start with uh, the rational story. So a, a slogan is that rational homotopy theory is supposed to be easy. And a consequence of this is that rational stable homotopy theory is supposed to be very easy. Uh, that's a sort of heuristic idea, but you can turn it into a theorem. So for any space X, you have a map from its stable homotopy groups to its reduced homology. And a theorem which goes back to Serre is that that map becomes an isomorphism rationally. So uh, stable homotopy groups are very difficult to compute, but homology is very simple to compute, or at least is much simpler to compute. And rationally, there isn't really a difference between the two. Uh, so as a consequence, the stable homotopy groups of spheres rationally are very simple. You just have Q in degree zero and zero in every other degree. In other words, the higher stable homotopy groups of spheres are all torsion groups. And in fact, Serre proved something better than that. He proved that the higher stable homotopy groups of spheres are all finite groups. Uh, so let me just show you what these look like um, in low degrees. Here's a list of them. Um, and so the question is, what's the pattern? What's going on here? Uh, and looking at this for the first time, you might say it just looks kind of random. Uh, so one qu question you might ask first is, how do you produce some examples of elements in the stable homotopy groups of spheres? So let's start there. Uh, so something a professor of mine said to me once when I was an undergraduate that kind of stuck with me is that the only place we really have any success in mathematics is when we can reduce something to linear algebra. That is the, the only kind of equations that we ever know how to solve are linear equations. And uh, so you might ask first, what can linear algebra tell you about the, the homotopy groups of spheres? So let me start by observing that a unitary group UN acts on a complex vector space of dimension N, and therefore it acts on the sphere of dimension 2N given by its one point compactification. That action you can think of as a map from the unitary group to the space of pointed maps from the 2n sphere to itself. And if you take this map and pass to homotopy groups, it gives you a map from pi star of un to pi star plus 2n of s2n. And taking a limit as n goes to infinity, 
you get something which is called the complex J homomorphism. So this is a map of abelian groups, which goes from pi star of U to the stable homotopy groups of spheres. So here U means, denotes the infinite unitary group, the space that you get by taking the direct limit of UN as N goes to infinity. Uh, so why is this uh, useful? Well, the, the right-hand side is something that uh, is mysterious that we're trying to get a handle on. And the left-hand side is something very simple that we understand quite well. So this is thanks to the Bott periodicity theorem. Bott actually computed what the homotopy groups of this infinite unitary group look like. Uh, they look like a copy of the integers in every odd degree and zero in every even degree. And this result is often stated in terms of complex K theory. Well, let me remind you, complex K theory is a uh, cohomology theory, which I'll denote by KU. And it's essentially defined by saying that if X is a something like a finite complex, then the complex uh, K theory of X is obtained by looking at isomorphism classes of complex vector bundles on X. Those form a commutative monoid with respect to the formation of direct sums. And you can take that commutative monoid and just formally adjoin inverses, take what's called its growth and deep group to make it into an abelian group. And that's what complex K theory is supposed to do in degree zero. You can also talk about complex K theory in other degrees and complex K theory in degree minus one is supposed to assign to a space X the set of homotopy classes of maps from X into this infinite unitary group. And well, Bott periodicity as a statement about K theory tells you that actually this cohomology theory is periodic with period two. So if you want to know about what complex K theory is doing in any degree, well, in every even degree, it has something to do with complex vector bundles. And in every odd degree, it has something to do with maps from X into the infinite unitary group. So let's go back to the complex J homomorphism. So for every, for every um, integer N, we can think of this as giving us a map from uh, the 2n minus first homotopy group of u, that's also, that's a copy of the integers. You can also think of it as uh, pi 2n of the complex K theory spectrum. And that's mapping to the 2n minus first stable homotopy group of spheres. So the, the image of that is a cyclic group because it's uh, a quotient of Z. And it's also a finite group because it's a subgroup of uh, pi 2n minus one of the sphere. And a, a basic question, which was asked and answered by Frank Adams is what does this finite cyclic group look like? What is the image of this complex J homomorphism? So I wanna just tell you about how he answered this question. Uh, so first, um, to understand the answer, it's best to think one prime at a time, right? The image of this J homomorphism is going to be a finite abelian group, and therefore it's a sum of finite abelian P groups for different primes P. And let's just focus on the sum end coming from a single prime. And for simplicity, I'm gonna take that prime to be odd. Okay, so first let's talk about getting an upper bound for what the image of this J homomorphism looks like. And for this, I wanna remind you of a feature that complex K theory has. It's complex K theory is equipped with what are called Adams operations. So for every integer G, there's an operation on complex K theory, which is usually denoted by psi G and essentially characterized by what it does to uh, complex vector bundles that can be written as a sum of line bundles. And what it does on that K theory class, I'm sorry? Is that a question? So to a sum of uh, complex line bundles, what it does to that K theory class is just assign the, 
the, uh, the K theory class of another complex vector bundle, which would be what you got if you summed the gth powers of those line bundles. So this is an operation, it acts on um, complex K-theory of any space. And if you take that space to be a sphere of dimension 2n, it gives you an operation on pi 2n of Ku. And that's a, a very simple map. It's just multiplication by the integer g to the n. Um, what Adams uh, proposed is that this Adams, what's now called the Adams conjecture, which is that applying this Adams operation doesn't change the value of the J homomorphism. If you have, uh, in other words, J composed with this Adams operation psi G is the same as J. And it, this was proved a few years later by Quillen, and it gives you an upper bound for what the image of the J homomorphism can look like in as a map to pi 2n minus one of the sphere. Uh, the image of J, it's, it's generated by a single element and this Adams conjecture tells you that element has to be annihilated by G to the n minus one. And that's actually true for any G that you choose. Um, but if you're interested in uh, per, what the P local component looks like, you get the best possible information by choosing certain special values of G, namely take G to be a topological generator for the group of p-adic units, a ZP star. Okay, so that's an upper bound. Uh, now let's talk about a lower bound. And again, I wanna focus on a particular odd prime P and I'm gonna write KU with a hat over it to indicate complex K theory completed at a prime P. Now, one thing that happens when you complete K-theory to prime P is that if you look at one of these Adams operations, psi G, and G is not divisible by P, then that's actually a stable cohomology operation. In, in fact, it's even an automorphism of the cohomology theory KU, or KU hat. And you can look at the fixed points of this automorphism. So I'm gonna write that as KU hat with the superscript psi G equals one. And what I mean by that is in the world of spectra, I wanna take the fiber of the map from KU hat to itself given by psi G minus the identity. And this fiber sequence is something that you can use to understand the homotopy of the left-hand side. Namely, we understand the homotopy groups of KU hat using bot periodicity, that what those look like in every even degree 2n is a copy of the p-adic integers. And in degree 2n, this operation psi g minus the identity is acting by multiplication by that same element from before, g to the n minus one. And so by looking at the long exact sequence of homotopy groups, we can understand the homotopy groups of the left-hand side. Um, in positive degrees, what you see is zero in every even degree. And this cyclic P group, ZP mod G to the N minus one in pi 2N minus one. And note that, that these odd homotopy groups, these are the same groups that were appearing in the upper bound, the previous slide. So now let's assume that P is an odd prime and let's take G to be a topological generator of ZP star. So what Adam showed is that if you take uh, the complex J homomorphism and compose it with the map from pi 2n minus one of the sphere to pi 2n minus one of this funny fixed point spectrum, that that's a surjective map. Here, the left-hand side is the group of integers and the right-hand side remember is this uh, finite cyclic group. And this gives you a lower bound on the size of the complex, uh, size of the image of J. The image of J has to surject onto this finite group that appears on the right. And that lower bound exactly matches with the upper bound that we got earlier, P locally. And what is that bound? Well, the P local part of the image of J First, in degree 2n minus 1, it looks like 0 if n is not divisible by p minus 1. 
And otherwise it looks like Z mod P to the some power, that power is K plus one, where K is the number of powers of P that divide N. So this working this out is just a simple bit of uh, arithmetic, um, thinking about these uh, numbers of the form G to the N minus one. Okay, so this is what the image of J looks like when you localize at an odd prime. Uh, you can also analyze what it looks like when you localize at the prime two, it's a little more complicated. And you can put those answers together and get a picture of what's going on overall. So let me just give you a, a table which shows what it looks like in low degrees. So here, the middle column, that's the same column that we had in the table I showed you before. Those are the stable homotopy groups of spheres in low degrees. And that column on the right is showing you what the image of the J homomorphism looks like. And what you can read off here is, well, first, the J homomorphism is non-trivial. It's giving you some elements in the stable homotopy groups of spheres, but it's definitely not giving you everything. Um, in particular, it's not giving you anything in even degrees. Um, and of course, these are only the first few stable homotopy groups of spheres. If we uh, took this out further and further, we would start seeing that the J homomorphism is really not seeing very much of the stable homotopy groups of spheres. It's only a small part of pi star of s, but the good news is it's a part that we can understand completely. You can say exactly what the image of J is. And the lesson that I wanna take away from this is that um, although the stable homotopy groups of spheres are, some, something that can appear random and chaotic, uh, if you ask the right questions, then they can exhibit very orderly behavior. And here, what's the right question to ask? Well, rather than looking at the entirety of the stable homotopy spheres, look just at the image of J and focus one prime at a time. And if you do that, then what you see is some orderly and even periodic behavior. For example, um, the image of P local image of J is non-trivial in pi 2n minus 1s exactly when P minus 1 divides n. So in some sense, you, one thing you can think of chromatic homotopy theory as an attempt to generalize the story that I just told you to get more complete information about uh, information in stable homotopy theory, and in particular, information about the, the stable homotopy groups of spheres. So what was important in the story I just told you? Well, one thing that was important was this cohomology theory KU. And a question that you could ask is, what happens if you tried to replace complex K theory by some other cohomology theory and try to do similar kinds of things. Could you get similar kind of information? So what are the essential features that KU had in this story? Well, one essential feature was bot periodicity. So uh, complex K theory was a cohomology theory. It's represented by a spectrum whose homotopy groups we understand completely thanks to this theorem of bots. And another important feature of complex K theory was that it's equipped with these atoms operations, these symmetries um, that we were exploiting in the, over the previous slots. So I'd like to take as a starting point, the bot periodicity. Let's look for some cohomology theories that seem to also have some kind of periodicity, satisfy some kind of periodicity. So let E be a multiplicative cohomology theory. So I mean something that where you input topological spaces and it outputs graded rings for you. Um, I'll denote that graded ring by E star of X or the E cohomology of X. We'll say that E is even if the E cohomology groups of a point are concentrated in even degrees. And we say that E is periodic if the E cohomology of a point contains an invertible element in degree two. The inverse then is an element in degree minus two. And the prototypical example, the motivating example is complex K theory 
And this is an even periodic cohomology theory because of bot periodicity. So I wanna talk now about some things that you could do if you had an even periodic cohomology theory. And for that, I wanna embark on a little bit of a digression. So let's say that you have, uh, let me remind you, uh, CP infinity, I'm gonna denote, used to denote infinite dimensional complex projective space. So that means the direct limit of CPN as N goes to infinity. So this is a space that you can study and it's interesting by virtue of being a classifying space. It's a classifying space for complex line bundles. So what that means is that there's a line bundle on CP infinity, I'll call it O of one. And it's a universal line bundle, meaning any other line bundle on any other reasonable space X can be written as the pullback of O of one along some continuous map from X to CP infinity. In fact, you have a bijective correspondence between homotopy classes of maps from X to CP infinity to isomorphism classes of complex line bundles on X. Okay, so what can you say about this space CP infinity? Well, a sort of basic elemental calculation in algebraic topology is the cohomology of CP infinity is a polynomial ring. It's a polynomial ring on a single generator T, which has degree two. And this generator is well-defined up to a sign. And this is something that you can exploit, the existence of this element T to define a characteristic class. So if L is a line, complex line bundle on a topological space X, classified by some map from X to CP infinity, then you can um, take this cohomology class T and pull it back along the map F to get some class in the cohomology of X. And that class has a name, it's called the first churn class of the line bundle L. And it's an important invariant, not just in algebraic topology, but also in um, fields that use algebraic topology, algebraic geometry, differential geometry, and so forth. So now let's talk not about ordinary cohomology, but one of these even periodic cohomology theories. Now these cohomology theories, you can also look at the cohomology of CP infinity, and the calculation goes more or less the same way. The cohomology of CP infinity looks like the cohomology of a point adjoin a power series generator T. Here, you could think of that generator T as being in degree two if you wanted, but I wanna take advantage of the periodicity of E to think of that class as living in degree zero instead. And, uh, but let me just warn you, um, in this situation, the element T is not canonical. There are lots of different choices that you can make of what that power series generator is. Uh, but you can use it in exactly the same way. As soon as you choose an element T there, you get a characteristic class out of it. If you have a line bundle classified by a map from X to CP infinity, you can pull back T along that map to get an element which now lives in, in the E cohomology of X in degree zero. I wanna also call that the first churn class of the line bundle L, but now it's a first churn class which lives in E cohomology rather than ordinary cohomology. So an important property of churn classes in their classical incarnation is that they're additive. If you take two complex line bundles and look at the first churn class of their tensor product, that's the sum of the churn classes of the individual factors. And the legend is that this whole theory goes back to a mistake that Quillen made. When Quillen was thinking about cohomology theories where you had a good notion of churn class, that initially he assumed that this formula would be true in general, but he quickly realized that that was not the case. For churn classes in generalized cohomology theories, you don't necessarily have this formula. And in fact, we can see that already by taking E to be complex K theory. So in the setting of complex K theory, you have in some sense a very simple theory of churn classes. Um, any complex line bundle is in particular a complex vector bundle of rank one, and therefore defines an element in the K-theory of whatever space you're, it lives on. Um, so I'll write that element 
as L with brackets around it. And you essentially define the first churn class of a line bundle to be the class of that line bundle. And actually, I want to normalize it so that the first churn class of the trivial bundle is zero. So I'll subtract one. And then, well, modulo that normalization, these churn classes, if you tensored the line bundles together, the churn classes would just multiply. That is, you have the formula which is written here on the slide. And if you subtract one from both sides, you learn that the first churn class of L0 tensor L1 is the first churn class of L0 plus the first churn class of L1 plus the product of the churn classes of L0 and L1. So it's a little bit of a more complicated formula than what you had in ordinary cohomology. Well, if you go to a general even periodic cohomology theory, you don't expect that either of the formulas that I had on the previous slide are going to be correct. But what you can say is that there's always some formula. There's always some formula depending on E that expresses the first churn class of L0 tensor L1 as a power series in the first churn class of L0 and the first churn class of L1. And this follows by analyzing the universal case. That is, there's a universal example of a space where you have two complex line bundles. That's the space CP infinity cross CP infinity. And you can compute the E cohomology of that space. It looks like a power series ring, now not on one generator, but on two. So for any one of these even periodic cohomology theories, there's some power series F which has this property, that power series in general could be complicated, but it's not arbitrary. It there's a couple of rules that it has to satisfy. For example, it's always symmetric in the two variables. And that's a consequence of the fact that the, uh, the operation of tensor product of complex line bundles is commutative up to isomorphism. The operation of tensor product of complex line bundles is also associative up to isomorphism. And that gives you this slightly more complicated formula written at the bottom of the slide. So what you encounter here is an algebraic structure and that algebraic structure has a name. Let R be a commutative ring. A formal group law over R is a power series in two variables with coefficients in R, which satisfies the identities that I wrote down on the previous slide. They say um, the second identities two and three are roughly saying this operation power series is commutative and associative in some sense. So what are some examples? Well, the easiest example is the power series F of ST is S plus T. That's called the additive formal group law. And the next easiest example is the one we met earlier. F of st is s plus t plus s times t. That's called the multiplicative formal group law. And well, just to orient us for some terminology I'll use later, if we have two formal group laws over the same commutative ring R, we say that they're isomorphic if they differ by a change of coordinates. And what I mean is that there's some invertible power series in one variable G, uh, such that conjugating by G converts F into F prime. And if we have two formal group laws that are isomorphic, we say that they, they have the same form associated formal group. So, what's the point? Well, this is exactly the structure that we were getting out of an even periodic cohomology theory. Every even periodic cohomology theory determines a formal group law over the commutative ring that you get by looking at the degree zero cohomology of a point. And that formal group, it's, it's characterized by this formula. It tells you how churn classes are supposed to behave when you tensor line bundles together. And this gives you a construction which takes an even periodic cohomology theory E and associates to it some purely algebraic data, namely a commutative ring R together with a formal group over R. And this is an extremely important uh, construction in stable homotopy theory. 
Um, and I wanna just indicate why it's um, important or why it's useful. It's the input to this construction is a cohomology theory or a spectrum. It's, it's something that lives in the world of stable homotopy theory. It lives in the world of topology. And what we're trying to do in algebraic topology is understand objects that live in topology by associating to them purely algebraic objects that are more rigid and easier to understand. And this is a construction in that vein. We try to understand a cohomology theory E by assigning to it a commutative ring and a formal group. Those, those are objects which are purely algebraic in nature and which were very well studied before they came up in algebraic topology. They, formal groups are very well understood uh, in part because they come up in algebraic number theory. Um, but another reason that this construction is important is that uh, it doesn't lose very much information. In fact, it's often possible to reverse this construction. So let's suppose that you started with a commutative ring R and a formal group over R. It's a theorem of Landweber that tells you in certain circumstances, there's a unique even periodic cohomology theory, which gives rise to this formal group by the procedure which I described earlier. And well, I, I don't wanna tell you what those hypotheses are um, in this lecture. Maybe you'll hear about them in one of the future lectures, but let me just say for right now, they're hypotheses that are easy to verify in practice and satisfied reasonably often. So an example where they're satisfied is you could take R to be the ring of integers and take the formal group law, the multiplicative formal group law that I wrote down earlier. And this actually is a situation where Landweber's theorem applies and Landweber will tell you there's an essentially unique cohomology theory that gives rise to this situation. And we know what that cohomology theory must be. It has to be complex K theory. Um, but a virtue of this is that it allows us to discover complex K-theory in a completely new way. That is, if we didn't know about complex K-theory in the first place, but somehow, uh, you know, Quillen had done his work on introducing this relationship with formal group laws and Landweber had proved this theorem, you could now discover complex K-theory. It's the cohomology theory that is related to the multiplicative formal group law. And this, this would be a discovery of a cohomology theory which would tell you nothing about the relationship of uh, complex K-theory with things like the unitary group or complex vector bundles. It's a purely algebraic way of thinking about what complex K-theory is, uh, is telling you. And that's good for us because I started this um, digression by telling you that we were looking for cohomology theories that are like complex K-theory. So if complex K-theory can be viewed as the output of this Landweber machine, well, why don't we look at other cohomology theories that can also uh, arise this way? So we might start by trying to understand what formal groups can look like. So formal groups, I told you earlier, are well understood and in fact, over an algebraically closed field, they're completely classified. So let K be an algebraically closed field. First, if K is a field of characteristic zero, then there's only one formal group up to isomorphism. They all look like the additive formal group. F of ST is S plus T. Now for fields of characteristic P, the story is much richer, um, but we can still completely classify formal groups. Uh, they're classified by a single invariant called the height, uh, which is either a positive integer or infinity. So we've already met two examples of formal groups. The multiplicative formal group is an example of a formal group of height one. And the additive formal group in characteristic P is an example of a formal group of height infinity. But there are also formal groups of all possible heights between one and infinity. Unfortunately, I can't write simple formulas for them because they're not given by polynomials, they're given by power series. But 
So this is a story in pure algebra. These formal groups have been classified. Um, what can we say about the corresponding cohomology theories? So let's fix a perfect field of characteristic P and a formal group, which I'm going to assume has finite height. And a theorem of Morava is that this formal group always arises from an even periodic cohomology theory, which is typically denoted by K of N. Now it depends on more than just N. For example, it depends on what prime P we're interested in, but it's traditional to only indicate N in the notation. So these cohomology theories are called Morava K theories. And I wanna explain the, the motivation for this uh, terminology. So let's suppose you take the simplest example where K is the finite field FP and F is the multiplicative formal group. Let's remember is a formal group of height one. Well, remember the multiplicative formal group over Z, that's the formal group that you get by looking at complex K theory KU. If you want the multiplicative group over FP, well, you get that by looking at KU and reducing it mod P. So complex K theory reduced mod P is the first of these Morava K theories. Uh, so you can think of these KNs for higher values of N as some kind of generalization of complex K theory, but it's not really complex K theory itself. It's complex K theory reduced mod P. So what if you were interested in complex K theory itself? Well, again, let's look at a formal group of height n over a perfect field k. Uh, a theorem of Lubin and Tate is that this formal group always has a universal deformation. That's a formal group which lives over not k, but a complete local ring with residue field k, something that looks like w of k adjoin n minus one power series generators. And well, this formal group F tilde also comes from an even periodic cohomology theory that's typically denoted by E sub N and referred to as Morava E theory. And this cohomology theory is also something that you can just get directly out of Land Weber's theorem. This is uh, this formal group that Lubin and Tate introduced is a situation where Land Weber's theorem applies. So what's an example? Well, this, if you look at the same example from the previous slide, um, th what this uh, Morava E theory will look like is not KU reduced mod P, but KU completed at the prime P. And that's um, more relevant to us. That's a spectrum which appeared in the story of the J homomorphism. Okay, so this gives you a machine for producing all kinds of cohomology theories, which are potentially interesting, but how can we exploit them? So I want to just... Uh, to explain this, I want to very briefly take a detour through what's called Bauss field localization. So let E be any cohomology theory. So we say that a map of spectra is an E equivalence if it induces an isomorphism on E homology. And we say that a spectrum is E local if every E equivalence from X to Y induces a bijection from the set of homotopy classes of maps from Y into Z to the set of homotopy classes of maps from X into Z. Now, a theorem of Bauss fields is that if you start with any spectrum X, you can find an E equivalence from X to a spectrum Y, which is E local. And a bit of abstract nonsense will tell you that in this situation, the spectrum Y is uniquely determined. It's typically denoted by LE of X and called the E localization of X. Um, and we're going to be primarily interested in the case where E is one of these Morava E theories, in which case this is denoted by Ln of X. So if you fix a spectrum and a prime number P, then you can look at these um, localizations, Ln of X. You can think of these as approximations to the spectrum X, and the approximations get better and better as N increases. And in fact, these are related to each other. They can be organized into an inverse system. L3 of X maps to L2 of X maps to L1 of X. And by convention, we can also consider L0 of X, which means the rationalization of X, what you get when you take X and you invert all primes. And 
And let me just mention um, L1 of X is related to the story that we told earlier. If you look at L1 of the sphere spectrum, it's homotopy groups. Well, in degree zero, it looks like Z localized at P. But if you look at what you get in uh, positive degrees, you see exactly the image of the J homomorphism uh, localized at the prime P. Um, so what can you say about this inverse system? Well, a theorem of Hopkins and Rabinell called the chromatic convergence theorem tells you that uh, if X is a finite spectrum, then the inverse limit of this system recovers the localization of X at a prime P. So for example, if you take X to be the sphere spectrum, this is telling you that if you're interested in the, the P local stable homotopy groups of spheres, all that information in principle is contained in this tower. All you need to do is understand these localizations LN applied to the sphere. So how are you gonna understand those? Well, let's try to understand them by induction. LN of any spectrum X maps to LN minus one of X. And I'm sorry, I'm uh, my screen is getting dim. Hang on a second. Um, ln of x maps to ln minus one of x, and that actually fits into a homotopy pullback square. So um, uh, where the upper right-hand corner is the localization of x, not with respect to Morava E theory, but with respect to Morava K theory. So um, if you haven't seen this before, it's probably going by too fast to absorb, but just the upshot of this is that if you wanna understand ln, it suffices to understand LN minus one and localization with respect to KN. So let's focus on the latter, localization with respect to KN. And this understanding this comes down to understanding the appropriate uh, generalization of Adams operations. So let's fix a formal group of height N over a field of characteristic P, which I'm now gonna take to be the algebraic closure of FP. Then you can look at the automorphism group of this formal group. That's a, a profinite group, which I'm gonna denote by G0, which is sometimes called the Morava stabilizer group. That's the autom group of automorphisms of the formal group F, where you regard the field that it's defined over as fixed. You could also look at a larger group, of automorphisms of the field together with the formal group. And these are closely related. They fit into a short exact sequence um, where G maps to the Galois group of FP bar over FP and G zero is the kernel of that map. So these groups are defined in a purely algebraic way. They're automorphism groups of purely algebraic data but an important theorem of Hopkins and Miller says that these uh, groups actually act on the uh, Morava E theory, these cohomology theories, Morava E theory that are introduced earlier. They act not just on the cohomology theory though, but at the spectrum level, those actions can be rigidified. Um, so just an example of, uh, to keep in mind, when n is equal to one, this Morava stabilizer group is actually the group ZP star. And the action on uh, Morava E theory is essentially by Adams operations uh, that I described earlier. Although here the context is a little bit different because we're working over FP bar rather than over FP. All right, so, so why is this theorem important? This result of Hopkins and Miller uh, that you, this group actually acts on the Morava E theory spectrum. It's useful because when a group acts on a spectrum, then you can look at the homotopy fixed points for that action. And in this case, the homotopy fixed points for that action is something which is highly relevant to the story. So a theorem essentially of Devonats and Hopkins is that uh, if you look at the homotopy fixed points for the action of this symmetry group G, on Morava E theory, then you recover the KN localization of the sphere spectrum. That's one of the terms that appeared in that fracture square earlier. And 
What is this saying in more concrete terms? When n is equal to one, this result is telling us what LK1 of the sphere spectrum looks like. It's something that appeared earlier in this talk when we were talking about the J homomorphism. It's this spectrum that you get by taking uh, the P completion of complex K theory and taking the fixed points for a generator of the atoms operations. All right, so I, I'm probably over time, although I wasn't keeping track of the time, but let me just summarize uh, what this is telling you. So what I've given you is an advertisement that sounds like it's a blueprint for, let's say, understanding stable homotopy theory, understanding the stable homotopy groups of spheres. So what do you need to do? Um, your first the strategy, you start by writing down these Morava E theories. So these are spectra which satisfy something like Bach periodicity. These are spectra where the homotopy groups are completely known. And then you study their symmetries. You study this uh, group that I introduced earlier, G, the ex extended Morava stabilizer group, which acts on these Morava E theories. And you look at the homotopy fixed points. That, that's something that you can think of as the KN localization of the sphere spectrum. And then this is something which depends on N, but you can allow N to vary and assemble these together. If you assemble them for all um, integers zero through M, then you get another localization of the spear spectrum, namely the localization with respect to Morava E theory. And then if you pass to the limit as M goes to infinity, the chromatic convergence theorem will tell you that you reconstruct the P local sphere. So that's all there is to it. Then you're done. Uh, if you take homotopy groups and that's the answer in principle. Now in practice, that's maybe not a, something that's feasible or a, you know, if you went into this talk thinking that I was gonna tell you what all the stable homotopy groups of spheres are, then I'm gonna disappoint you um, that every step of this process um, involves something with potentially a lot of complications. And maybe the biggest complication is that uh, as, when N is equal to one, this Morava stabilizer group is an abelian group. But as soon as N is greater than or equal to two, the, the symmetry group that you meet is not commutative. And moreover, this group, you have to understand the action of this group on Morava E theory. And that action is quite complicated even at the level of homotopy groups. So the zeroth homotopy group of Morava E theory, I told you earlier, uh, at least implicitly, that looks like a power series ring on n minus one variables, but that description as a power series ring is not one that's really compatible with the action of this symmetry group. In, those, in terms of that power series description, the action of this group is, is very complicated and nonlinear. So as a result, um, it's not so easy to get calculational information out of the strategy I described on the previous slide, but you still get a lot of useful um, conceptual information. That is the picture that I've sketched to you, which is what the subject of chromatic homotopy theory is about, at least in part, um, has been very useful in understanding things about the stable homotopy groups of spheres and stable homotopy theory in general. All right, uh, that's all that I have to say. Thank you very much.